Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I don't think there's a session chair, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Kevin Kirschenbaum from IDA. Uh, I'll be uh, passing the microphone off to John and Andrew in a moment. They're also from IDA. We're going to talk about uh, reproducible research. So what do we mean by reproducible research? Today, uh, we're going to just treat this as a set of techniques that allow you to exactly recreate uh, one of your analyses. So there, you'll find huge definitions online, but this is what we're going to work off of today. So set of techniques to exactly recreate. And this is distinct from replicable. So replicable is a thing we care about in science. You go out, you run a test on your new drug or your new uh, F35. Uh, you find out that your drug is effective, your F35 is effective, uh, you publish your results. You go out a second time, you do a similar test, you get hopefully the same result that it's effective. So that is replicable. Today we're actually going to talk specifically about reproducible. So you go out, you run this test, you collect all of your data, you do your analysis. Uh, later, if someone else were to take that exact same data, they could do your exact same analysis and get your exact same result. So why do we care about being able to do the exact same thing? Well, let's uh, take a look at an ideal analysis workflow. So this is what you know you imagine your analysis work looks like. You go out to the field, you collect data, you format it, you do your analysis, you know, you give it to an editor, they tell you you misspelled the word, uh, you publish it, and then you never think about your project again. Um, you all high five and move on with your life. Uh, really, it looks slightly more like this. Uh, you collect data, you format your data, you try to do your analysis, you iterate just a ton. Uh, your sponsor gets back to you and says they want something different, your editors get back to you, your project leader gets back to you and says, no, the thing you're doing is, is crazy. And so you need to keep revisiting this analysis phase and tweaking your analysis. And every time you do something manually, you introduce the possibility for, like, to introduce some errors, and every time you have to do something by hand, it takes forever. Uh, sometimes you can get kicked back uh, with new data, and you have to redo the whole thing. Uh, sometimes you get kicked back, and you just need to tweak your data slightly. So you spend a lot of time in these boxes just redoing the exact same thing. And so this is why we're saying reproducibility is so important. You can speed up your life and avoid the uh, possibility of some extra mistakes by automating things and we'll we'll talk to you a little bit about how to do that but if you notice uh, you never get to never think about project again uh, as an example uh, three years ago someone asked me what I know about reproducible research and here I stand before you so this never exists uh, in fact you tend to go back, sometimes you're tasked with a similar analysis and you want to use old parts of what you've done. Sometimes you're asked, hey, six months ago, why did you make that decision? Uh, sometimes you hand the project off to an entirely different person. Uh, and you've now, depending on how you've given them this, you've either uh, made a friend or enemy for life. And this is what your workflow tends to look like. So what we're going to talk to you about today is these boxes over here, how you can make it so your work is exactly reproducible quickly and the same way every time. So why should you do this? Benefits you. Uh, and if you're a project leader, you should encourage your team because it will benefit your team. So work habits, easier to pick up projects later. Again, uh, you are always asked, hey, can you go make a small change? Uh, it also helps to reduce the risk of uh, introducing some errors. Uh, the big thing, if you're a project leader, this helps you provide a better product to your sponsor. The big complaint is, isn't this extra work? And the answer is, it's hard to break bad habits. But uh, 
it's probably worth it. I think most of us exist in this lower right-hand corner. Uh, we're doing things, uh, we're regularly providing updates or regularly making some changes, and it can take a long time. And so I think it's definitely worth at least paying attention for the next hour and a half and maybe going home and making some attempt to use some of these techniques that we're going to talk to you about today. So this is how we, uh, we've been thinking about reproducible research. Same data plus same methods equals same results. And so today, uh, what I want you to think about is the same data section, how you're going to organize your files when you get home, how you're going to uh, set everything up so that when you come back to this project six months later or a year later, all of your information has been preserved. And same methods, again, uh, you think, think about how you're going to document how all of your decisions were made and how you can uh, organize your analysis. So because uh, the three of us work at IDA, we talk a lot about operational testing. So today we're going to talk about uh, this example. Uh, it's a made up rigible, rigid hulled inflatable boat or uh, rib. So the Navy wants to make a new boat. Uh, they've actually built one now. Again, this is made up. Uh, and they have run a bunch of tests to figure out how long it takes to launch this thing. Uh, they've ran it, uh, they tried launching it a day and night. They launched their two different boat designs, a seven meter boat and a 13 meter boat. And this is the time that it took. Sometimes they loaded it with 200 kilograms and two passengers, 100 kilograms and two passengers, four passengers and so on. So this is uh, made up data. And so we're going to keep coming back to this example and touching on it and talk about how you can uh, analyze this and uh, produce some sort of uh, report for it. And this is what your, uh, sorry about the <laughs> tiny text, uh, this is what your uh, analysis flow might look like. You're going to prepare, perform, and then present your analysis. Each of these sections are what uh, Andrew and John are going to talk about here today. Uh, when you prepare for your analysis, you want to organize it, make sure it's properly formatted. Uh, and so on. So they're going to go through each of these steps. So these are the goals to creating a good report. Uh, they're going to talk about how you can do that. Now, uh, before I hand the microphone off, uh, specifically they're going to talk about how you can do this in R. Uh, they're going to tell you, so this is uh, analysis independent, you don't, it, it, you know, uh, you, you need to have everything organized and understandable regardless of how you do your analysis. But for the rest of this talk, to try to give people techniques to walk away with, uh, we're going to focus on the programming language R and some of the tools that surround that because there are a lot of tools there to help you uh, do all these things. And then just the kind of last point I want you to think about is you don't have to get all of this right away the first time. Uh, this should be kind of an iterative thing and you should always try to get better. Uh, we have tried, for example, when we're making these slides, you'll see there's some kind of weird little thing down here. We didn't make this in PowerPoint. We tried to make it using R. Uh, we tried to use Git to collaborate with each other. Uh, it was weird and tricky, but I think ultimately worth it. And uh, we've actually used a lot of the techniques that we're talking about here to make this presentation. Uh, and that's also why occasionally the uh, text will be smaller than probably intended. Uh, we're <laughs> we are working on this. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand the microphone off and uh, John's gonna talk about how to prepare and uh, perform your analysis. Thank you, Kevin. Volume okay? All right. Great, so um, what I wanna talk about broadly today uh, are some of the tools and techniques that we've had success with um, at IDA to make our analyses more reproducible. Um, so first I'll talk a little bit about what we do uh, while we're preparing um, to get our analyses underway. What are some of the steps that you can do 
to make your analysis more reproducible. And then I'll talk about some of the things that we think about while we're actually performing our statistical analyses in R. So analysis preparation. Uh, one of the things that's really key for a reproducible analysis um, is that it is properly organized. Properly organized for yourself uh, when you come back to it at a later point in time so that you can more easily understand what files were important. Uh, but also for other people who maybe come onto your team at a different point and in time, and they need to understand the, the structure of a project so that they can get up to speed quickly. Some features of a well-organized analysis or a well-organized project um, are that it is uh, self-contained. Uh, it's a self-contained unit, okay? You don't have to share multiple things with, with different people. Um, and that the, the file history, the history of that project is, is preserved. You have a database or a list of every change that you've made to that project. So the, the, what I'm gonna talk about first are how we get at some of these features that achieve this goal of an organized analysis. And a simple starting point, and this may be obvious to most people in this room, but it's simply to put all of the components of your analysis into one folder, one place on your computer for that project. Um, and in the case of the rib example, uh, here's, a, here's the, uh, the folder hierarchy for, for the rib data analysis. I have a couple data folders, I have a docs folder, a folder for figures, and a folder for source code, and so on. And all of these components of this analysis are in this one overarching folder that I can just zip up or check into source control and share with other people. Now, this has a lot of folders, and this may be a complicated structure for some people, but you don't need to get this complicated to be very effective, okay? Minimally, you can just have, for example, uh, a folder for data and a folder for code, and that might, might be enough for your project. So organizing every, everything into one project directory is an effective first step, rather than having different parts of your project in different parts of your computer. That can get very confusing. You don't have to take this hierarchy idea to the extreme, though. You don't have, not every file has to be in a folder. You don't, have to, don't make this hierarchy too deep. That can get confusing. Once you have everything set up into one project folder, you've sort of put yourself in a position to take advantage of, of R projects. And if you're working with R in R Studio, R Studio has this powerful notion of a, product, of a project, which makes it straightforward for you to divide your work into multiple different contexts. Why is this important? Often we don't work on one project at the same time, right? We are often juggling multiple different analysis tasks at once. And when you're doing multiple different analyses in R Studio, you wanna be able to keep project specific variables separated from each other uh, so, so that things that are specific to one project don't get littered into the R sessions of different projects. So, the notion of an R project is setting project-specific variables and formatting niceties uh, into, into different contexts. And let me give you an example of, of why this is important. Uh, every time I work on an analysis, I clean my data, and I always call that cleaned data variable doubt. I always use that variable name for my clean data. And so every analysis I work on has this variable dat. Now, if I'm working on multiple analyses in R Studio, uh, I need a way of telling R uh, which DAT corresponds to which analysis. And so R Studio has solved that problem by um, adding context to the projects that I'm working on. In your file folder, um, an R project is indicated by a text file uh, that tells R Studio that this is a project, this is a place where I wanna keep track of the formatting and the other, other project-specific variables. So an R project file is just a text file uh, with, with some data in it that tells R what I want for my project. When you start working on a new project, the first thing that you should do is create an R project. It's a lot easier to start off on the right foot by creating an R project than taking an old project and making it a project at a later point after you've already worked on it. Um, and luckily, this is a really easy thing to do in our studio. Um, if you start working on a new thing, it's easy enough just to go to file, click our project, and then everything is created automatically for you, and our studio takes care of all of, all of the hard work. Um, 
And you'll also notice that when you, if you can read here, when you create a, a, an, R pro, an R project, RStudio will ask you, uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna make a, a Git repository for this? And so ver version control is the next thing that I wanna talk about that's important for having an organized file analysis. So version control comes after uh, project history, project management, if you're using RStudio. Um, yes? So what is the difference between the signal between okay. Git and GitHub? Is yeah. Git something you can establish here on your own? Sure, yeah, so I'll talk about, I, I, I'm not gonna talk a lot about, about GitHub, but that's an important thing to bring up. So GitHub um, and Bitbucket and these websites, these are, this is like a central place on the internet uh, where you can put your uh, version controlled, your Git work, and collaborate with other people and keep track of projects. So GitHub is kind of like the place online where you collaborate and work with people. Git is the program on your computer that keeps track of those files, that runs, and then it connects out to GitHub. Does that help you a, a little bit? If you use R Studio, I believe Git is part of R Studio. The interface is part of it, but you have to load Git separately in order for it to show up. If you go to R Studio uh, Tools and then look at the uh, that's right. Yeah, you have to load Git separately. Right. I but I, I believe that Git yeah. comes bundled with our studio. Yeah. No. It does not. No. Uh, Git does not come bundled with our studio. But if our studio sees that you have Git installed in your computer, right. then it will provide you with the facilities to interact with Git. Okay. Thank you for that. So. Okay. Thanks for that question. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. So um, version control is like a. It, it's something that we, we borrow in the statistics world uh, from the software engineering world. Um, and the basic idea of version control, of which Git is one system for doing version control, is that we want to turn our, our project or our directory with all of our analysis uh, into a database or, or, a repos or a repository, per se. Um, so the idea behind version control is that your analysis, your project code uh, is data, and we want to track the changes that occur to that data. And we want to have, for example, a list of all of the most important changes that I've made to my project uh, or my code. Um, another way of explaining Git and version control is that it is control S on steroids. And the difference between Git and control S is that control S only keeps track of my most current changes to my project, uh, whereas Git, uh, you, can inf you can tell Git to keep track of all of the most important changes I've ever made to a project. So it's this more powerful, you have this more, more powerful notion of uh, what is the history of my project. And why might we want this, this version control? Why, why, might we, my, why might this be of u any use to us? Well, if I keep track of all the most important changes to my project, I can traverse the history of my project. I can roll back changes that I've made to my project. I think we've all been in a situation where we've made uh, changes to code or analysis and something has broken uh, and I've introduced so many bugs and it's unclear how to fix those bugs or maybe it would take so much time to fix those bugs uh, that I might wish, oh, I, I just want to like roll back to uh, a previous point in history. I, I wish I could just go back to this morning when I hit control S. Um, with Git, you can keep track of those changes uh, and you have that ability to roll back to a previous place. It's also useful for collaboration with people. Different people have, you'll, you, almost no one works on projects in a vacuum. We're collaborating with other people. And I, Kevin and Andrew, we all have copies of this presentation on our different computers. Git is a way of keeping track of all of the changes that we've made individually to this project. And it helps us merge those changes together into a final product. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good way of, of collaborating and preserving sanity. And there are some other great features as well. We think that version control should be ubiquitous uh, for, our, for, for our analysis. Um, so there are all different parts, um, all, all these different components of our analysis come together to make the final product. And it's worthwhile, we think, to keep track of all of the changes that we make to these, to these components. Um, so data and source code in particular is an obvious candidate for things that we might wanna keep track of the changes to. Um, but we, can, we may also wanna keep track of like, how did we change our graphs our manuscripts, our presentations, our bibliographies, like how did these evolve? And if we are working on manuscripts and presentations with other people, we can use Git to collaborate and knit or merge all of our changes together. 
Um, the best way to set yourself up for Git success is to um, keep all of these different components that feed into your analysis or your final product uh, in plain text or something that's as close to plain text as possible so that it's, it, it turns out it's easier for Git to inspect the changes you make to plain, to plain text files uh, than other types of files on your computer. And in addition to that, plain text is it's light, it's readable, it's portable, and if I share my analyses with other people, if I share a plain text file from my Mac to someone's Linux or Windows computer, I can be reasonably sure that it will work well on their computer. Um, whereas if I do my analysis in some, in, or if there's some component of my project that's in a you know, Microsoft 98 Word file, right? I don't know, that's not easily shareable because that's like a, a more of a binary type file. It might not run well on every, everyone's computer and it's harder to check in to, to Git. I'm not gonna teach you everything you know about how to, get, how to use Git. This is really not the right forum for learning Git, um, but I'll help you with some resources. And two things you should know is that Git is built into RStudio and um, there are websites uh, that are specifically made for uh, our users, statisticians, to learn about Git and version, and version control, such as happygitwithr.com. Uh, Credit to Jenny Bryan for that website. Next thing I'll talk about is, is properly formatted data. Um, I'm pretty sure that we all work on different programs and we get, we get data from these programs that come in all shapes and sizes. And it's a really useful to have a, a standard for data. Uh, so that when I get new data or when I share data, there's uh, as little mental overhead as possible um, for working with new data sets. So we think the components of properly formatted data are a consistent format, uh, a light and universal format, and also it's a format that's, that's easy to make and document changes to. And so we're gonna push uh, tidy data as a format um, that you can use that, that has all three of these features. Um, in it, and I'll get to tidy data in a moment. Uh, excuse me? Uh, small file size, right? Like something like plain text, small file size. As far as managing your data goes, uh, one of the things that, that we advocate for is that you keep your raw data folder as read only. So the original data that comes for a project, um, we think that you should not make any direct changes to that original raw data. Once you, if you make changes to your, raw, your original raw data, save those somewhere else as a separate file. And the reason we advocate for this is that when you share your data or project with somebody else, uh, not changing the raw data or the original data gives everyone the same starting point uh, for working on, it, on an analysis. So something that you can consider is removing write, write permissions from raw data files. That will prevent you from making changes to those files. And plain text data, like I said, is great for short, medium duration projects. Long duration projects or large projects may benefit from a, a database. Um, but for now, I'll mostly talk about, about plain text data. Um, here's the data again from the rib example. Um, this is called like a, a wide format data set. Um, or if you're used to tidy data, this may be called a, a messy data uh, format, a messy data. Um, this is, it's logical to record data from our experiments in this kind of format because you can just go down to each set. You can sort of you know, look at the rows and the columns and find, uh, oh, I need to put the number 19 into this cell. So it's natural to record data from an experiment in this way. Um, but notice that there's different variables, there's values that are confounded with different variables uh, in the headers here. Um, and these, like the, uh, numbers in this column represent variables, but, how, but that's different from the numbers in this column which represent responses. So this is not exactly a consistent format. Um, this format is very specific to this data set. So a wide format, there are some advantages though. Um, a wide format data is useful for, it's useful for presenting data in this format. It's also useful for asking and answering very simple questions of our data, such as, for example, what time, uh, what was the time to launch a 13 meter boat uh, during the day with these two other variables? You can just look it up in the data set and find that it takes 18 minutes. But it's not good, this messy wide data set is not good for answering more complex questions. 
costs. For example, how does the time to launch a 13 meter boat with four passengers change under, over different conditions? These more complicated questions require statistical models and statistical models require, uh, we think should be, should input some sort of uh, universal data set considering most statistical models uh, require design matrices. Um, so we're gonna advocate for tidy data um, as a solution to this data standardization problem. Uh, the components of tidy data are that every row of our tidy data set is an observation and every column of the, of the, of the table uh, is a variable on which we measure our, our observations. So variables go in, are, uh, correspond to columns, observations correspond to rows, um, and you can see that there is one column in particular, usually like the last column uh, for the response variable. Additionally, one observational unit per table. These are the tenants of tidy data. We like this format because essentially every tidy data set is the same. If you follow these rules, it's much easier to think about your data, understand your data, make changes to data. Whereas if you follow the wide or messy data format, things can get more complicated because there are different ways that a format can be, that a table can be messy or wide, um, which is, gets complicated when you're collaborating with people. Here's an example of what the rib data looks like once you've tidied it up. Uh, you see we've decoupled um, th uh, the previous variables and now each column is a single variable. Launch time is a variable here um, and each row of this data set is an observation. And this is going to be much easier for you um, to put into a computer uh, and work with when you make your statistical model. Now there's a lot of functions in R that can help you take wide or messy data and turn it into uh, tidy data. And so uh, for your reference, uh, the R libraries dplyr uh, and tidy R contain a lot of simple functions for help you, to help you uh, work uh, with, with, me with messy data and turn it into tidy data. Um, and there's plenty of good resources and documentation uh, for these two R packages. Once you've taken your uh, wide or messy data and made it into clean, tidy data, uh, re recall that I said you don't want to make any changes to your original source data set. Um, so once you do that, save this data set somewhere else so that you can come back to it, but don't overwrite your original data set. The other advantage of tidy data is that if you have to make changes to your data set, it's much easier to make changes to a tidy data set than it is to a messy data set. If you have to, for example, uh, in this case, we have to uh, delete uh, one of the observations from the, rib from the rib analysis. Deleting an observation in this case just means deleting a row from the tidy data set because observations correspond to rows in the tidy data format. Um, in, the, in other wide or messy formats, you may have to do uh, something different than just deleting a row. Um, and also, this can be kept track of in a reproducible manner in our code we can, for example, add comments to say why we are making changes to the data set and then write those changes to a new file. So changing data can be part of a reproducible workflow. Okay. Questions before I talk about performance, performing analysis? Okay. Uh, a tenant of uh, good uh, reproducible analysis is understandable code. And what are some good features of, of code that's easy to understand? Um, first of all, a consistent code style is useful for understandability and liberal use of documentation. Um, what are these functions and what do they do and what do they depend on? Good documentation is, gr is great for reproducible analysis. It's great for you, you at a later point in time and it's great for your collaborators. <laughs> So I'll talk a little bit about documenting everything. And this goes back a little bit to, to version control and, and Git. If you use Git and version, or uh, another version control software to keep track of the changes that you make to your code, uh, some aspects um, of, of, your, of your code will be documented. For example, um, uh, the, authors, the author of certain files will be kept track of, and when files were created or modified, that can automatically be kept track of the, um, uh, that history can be preserved by version control. Um, but Git doesn't take care of everything. You still have to document, it's worthwhile to document what your functions do, uh, what are the, vari what the variables in the functions uh, 
control and, and so on for people. Um, it is useful uh, if you want to force yourself to document every part of your analysis. It can be useful to, to package your analysis into an R package. In that case, documentation becomes a lot less optional. Um, so R packages can be a good way of forcing yourself to, to document things. It's worthwhile to make your code easy to read. And why is this? Well, a lot of times we'll write a function and then we'll come back to it six months later. And I may say, I may have a really hard time understanding what I did, even though I was the one who originally did it six months ago. I think we've all had this problem. And so I'm gonna walk you through uh, sort of three ways that, three things you can take advantage of to make your code just a little bit more understandable. And one quick tip to make code more readable is to make liberal use of spacing, white spacing around operators um, and new lines in your code file. Um, so I have a function here that I think it just, it takes y mod x and it, it adds one to it. And in the first example, um, I put my entire R function on, on one line. There's no spacing around operators, um, and it's just a one line thing, and, and it's, it's, it's harder to read this way. Um, but when I use appropriate like new lines and appropriate spacing around operators, it's easier, to, it's easier for me, at least, to understand what's going on. Um, I, I try to write every function this way. Um, with uh, a new line after an open brace, um, and then a closed brace always goes on its own new line. And having this, this consistent style helps me uh, walk through all of the code that I've made. And then the next two examples I'll talk about is, often we have to write functions that are composed. We will take one function and we will plug it into multiple different functions. And in this case, things can get a little bit hairy if you try to put multiple composed functions on one line, I may get confused about, for example, in the, in the example up here, which of these closed parentheses corresponds to which function. But if you, if you add appropriate white space and new lines again, you can tell more easily which parentheses correspond to which functions. And the code just generally becomes much more readable in this fashion. So that's tip number two for writing understandable code. Um, and my final tip is that um, if you decouple, so this is, this is another way of, of sort of decoupling this, um, all of these composed functions. I may assign each function, each step to an intermediate variable and then uh, evaluate those variables one at a time. And uh, I think this is, this is a really common way of writing code if, if you're an, R, if you're, um, an inter intermediate or, or beginner, beginner R user. And I, I still write code this way very often. Um, the only problem with this is that if you write code, if you, if you have all these immediate, intermediate variables in your R environments, you very quickly will, pop, will um, make a, you'll, you'll quickly produce a lot of clutter in your workspace, and you'll have a lot of variable names that uh, you don't really care about in particular. That could cause some problems for you down the line if you use a lot of simple generic variable names like I do. So a solution to this problem is to use the pipe operator. And what this is doing, what this pipe operator does is it simply takes the output of one of the, of the last function and it plugs it in as the first input to the next function. And this is a really powerful way of, of, of both evaluating a string of composed functions and not polluting your workspace with variables that you don't care about so that you have more variable names to use later. So that's tip number three for writing understandable code. And the last thing, um, the last step, uh, part of, of reproducible research while you're performing your analysis is writing code in a way that minimizes the opportunity for errors. And I'll give you two features of minimal opportunity for error in reproducible analyses. Um, feature number one that I think is most important is if you find yourself using the same code over and over again, um, stop that and take that that code and wrap it into a function so that you can reuse it. Um, also, and the second feature is uh, make your analyses reproducibly random. And this is an important point uh, if you're collaborating with others on an analysis that requires statistical simulation. Let me talk a little bit about the first point. I said turn, turn your repeated code into functions. And this goes back to a programming principle, do not repeat yourself, DRY. Um, I think we've all run into a problem when we're doing our statistical analyses where I start copying and pasting a bunch of code, for example, a single line over and over again. I realize that there is an error in what I did, and I realize how to fix it, 
and I fix all of my lines but one. I miss one line of code, okay? And this is really common. I'm still guilty of this. This happens sometimes. But if I'd simply taken the, the function that I was repeating over and over again and, and wrapped that into a function and instead iterated that function, then I only have to change it once in order to fix that bug. And I will have reduced the number of copy-paste errors that I'm inviting into my code. So this is, a, this is an example of how we do it um, with the rib data set. I think that uh, we can all sympathize with cases where um, we'll analyze one data set, the project's not over, and then we'll get a, a new data set that's the same format as the old data set, but it's from, like, it's from say, the, the next phase of testing or the last phase of testing, and I'll have to go through and clean that messy data into tidy data all over again. It's very useful to take the, the function, the, the steps that we use to produce tidy data and just wrap those into a function so, and so, so that I can repeat that function throughout my entire project. Good file naming practices are also really important here. Um, I have some uh, examples of bad file names for you. For example, update.r, what does that do, who knows? John's new file with punctuation and whitespace.r, which may, not, may work well on your file system, but may not work well on your friend's Macintosh file system. The figure1.png, who knows what that means. Um, examples of good files. Clean data.1, or 0, zero 01 clean data dot, dot r. I know that the purpose of this file, I know that it cleans data, and that 01 could be an indicator that this is the first file in my analysis that should be run. Fit model dot r, 0, 02. The purpose of this file is to fit a statistical model, and the 0, 02 tells me that this is the second model that should be run. So good file names that are both descriptive uh, and work well on, on all file systems are important when making reproducible research. Here are just some examples of some good file names. Please do not use any white space in file names. Make file names that are both machine readable and human readable. That means they work well with tools that search over different file names, but they're also very descriptive. And use file names that, that play well with whatever the default ordering is of your file system. Jenny Bryan has a great talk about, about uh, and she has great tips about how to name things, how to name different pieces of your analysis. And lastly, this is something that is very useful if you are working on an analysis that requires simulation or if you're working on a Bayesian computation, you, you and your friend Andrew, you might be running the same simu simulation, you may be get getting different numbers. Um, but if you're both getting different numbers, it's hard to tell uh, why you're getting different numbers or if you did something that's different. So in this example, um, what I've done here is generate 10,000 observations X and Y and fit a linear model and I've got, I got a coefficient. And then I did the same thing again, and I got a different coefficient, as you would expect from uh, the randomness. Um, but if you set a seed, you can think of a seed as a starting point for random number generation. If Andrew and I always start at the same place, then we will be, ex be able to exactly reproduce the same model coefficients. And if they're different, I will, I will be able to track down why they're different. I'll know that that difference is not because of, of the seed, because we have the same seed. So that's the last tip um, for collaborating and, and uh, working on uh, making your analyses more reproducible. And I'll hand it over to Andrew now to wrap us up for um, the next section. Thank you. Um, all right, so I, I'm gonna be talking about our last section um, where now you've, you've completed your analysis and so far you have um, done as much as you can to make your, your research reproducible up till now and you're at the final step where you need to present your results um, and or hand off your code to somebody else. Um, and then I'll wrap up at the end as well. <coughs> um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, two topics in this section. If you recall back to our initial outline for today's talk, I'm gonna be talking about reporting and then I'm also gonna be talking about making sure that your code is easily shareable with somebody else. Um, so when we talk about reporting in ways that are, uh, in a way that is agile, um, some of the things that we look for are uh, reporting in ways that minimize opportunities to introduce error. So similar to what um, kind of 
going further on something that John talked about, minimizing opportunities to introduce errors into your analyses. Uh, reporting that's easy to rerun when things change, maybe data changes or circumstances change. Um, and then finally, this is kind of a, just a bonus topic, but in a way that makes it easy to match your, your organization's format. Um, so I need to first tell you that each of these three things are underpinned by our markdown. And um, this is, the next couple slides are gonna be the only part of this talk that is uh, explicitly R. Um, most of the things we've talked about so far today, you can uh, move into other, um, other use, how you could implement them using other tools. But first I'm gonna give you the next few slides a uh, primer to R Markdown. Um, R Markdown is gonna support each of these, these features of Agile reporting. What is R Markdown? Um, R Markdown allows you to uh, combine your code, its results, and your narrative into a single product, a single document. And this is important because it directly links the reporting of your results with the code that generated uh, figures, values, any of the information that's, that you're reporting, you can trace back directly to how you got that number or how you made that figure. There's a direct link there and that's what's important here. An R Markdown file is just a plain text file. Um, it has a, the uh, extension RMD, so you might have seen one before. There are three important pieces in an R Markdown file. So first you have a header, and I'm gonna show you these on the next slide. You have a header, you have R code, and then you have plain text. And that plain text may or may not be formatted with some simple formatting, so things like uh, stars and um, to, to denote bold or italics or heading, headers. So I'll show you some what that might look like. So you've got these three things in an RMD file, text, which is a, just a text file. So this is what one might look like. Um, at the top here is our header, and it's denoted by these three, three dashes. There's some metadata up here, which is the name of your analysis, um, authors, date, things like, things like that. But what's most important to point out is that this is where, you're gonna, where you would uh, note the, your preferred output format. So I'm showing you an HTML document here. Um, next you see some R code. This is in, uh, denoted by these three backticks, backtick R, and uh, so this is a, code, a chunk of R code. Next you see some plain text with a little bit of uh, formatting. These two hash marks are gonna turn this into a header. Um, more R code and more text. Okay, so that, it's just a simple text file with those three components and they're all woven together. After you've written an R Markdown document, you will, um, uh, behind the scenes, you don't, uh, these, so it's this R package knitter and a utility pandoc that are really gonna do the work of turning your R Markdown document, uh, your R Markdown file into your desired output format. So um, it's not so important, I'll show you on the next couple slides the details of how this works, but I want you to be familiar with the names knitter and pandoc because you might hear them or see them as you're learning about R Markdown. Um, so you've written your R Markdown report as, as a text file. It's, has your narrative and raw code. Knitter is going to take, take uh, your R Markdown document, turn it into a Markdown document by running your R code and weaving it together with your narrative. And then Pandoc is gonna uh, turn it into your desired output format. Um, so I'm gonna show you that this is trivially easy in our studio. Um, so again, the details uh, are not so important because it's all, it's all gonna work for you in, in, in our studio. So, um, if you just go up to File New, you'll get you know our Markdown document. You'll get a GUI that looks like this. It's going to ask you to put in some metadata, um, and of course you can change this all later. So just to get yourself started, you put in a title and your author, and they recommend and we recommend um, starting just with HTML because you can change the output format later at any time. So this will get you off the ground. Hit OK. It's going to start you with a. Um, in your editor with a text file that you can begin writing your narrative and, your, um, and, and placing your code inside. So this is actually the same, I'm sorry it's small, it's not meant to be read I guess anyway, um, but this is the same R Markdown file that I showed you a couple slides ago, but this is just what it's gonna look like in, your, in our studio. So again, you can see the, the header, which is, gonna be, which is placed in here automatically for you, your R code, some text, R code, text, R code. Um, so this is what one looks like when, when you're writing it when you're working in our studio. 
Um, and when you're done writing, you, all you have to do is click knit. And that's when Knitter and Pandoc are going to take over and render the code, your R code, and, and um, piece it together with your narrative. So this is what it looks like when you're all done. You see the metadata that we provided, our title, author. Uh, this is our formatted header with those two hash signs. You can see our uh, one or two lines of narrative here. And then the figure that we produced has been, has been rendered and, and put in the proper place. So this is what it looks like when you're all done. Um, so I, I certainly am not teaching you everything you need to know about our markdown, so I encourage you to uh, look at this resource. There's lots of good resources. Um, but this is where you can find out about all the different types of output formats that you can use, um, how you can find out more about what the header does, um, some of the syntax, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of good, a lot of good resources out there, but I just wanted to, get to give you a primer to know what, what it is that we're talking about here. <coughs> What does our markdown do to support these three, uh, these three features of Agile reporting? Well, I mentioned that using our markdown can minimize your opportunities to introduce errors. This is a scenario that has maybe happened, this has happened to me, it maybe happened to some of you. You uh, work on your analysis in R or in whatever tool you like to use, and then you write your report in Word, and then um, you make some references to things like uh, the number of trials, we used data from 10 trials. Of these 10 trials, seven were performed during the day, three were performed at night, and you find out that you need to make a change to your data. So you go back and you update your analysis, and then you go to your Word document and you update your Word document, uh, change the tens to nines, but uh, what, you, what happens sometimes is you miss a couple of those references. So you, you did change this one, but you missed a couple of other places in your report where you've used a magic number, right? So, um, so this happens, and now you've got an error in your report, and it's going to be hard to track down. And um, you might not notice this until it's, until it, you know, it's ready to go out the door. So these are, these are things that, that happen to all of us. Um, how can our markdown help us here? Well, anytime you see a magic number in your report, uh, you can replace that with code. And, and so that when, when, our, when you knit your report or compile your report, um, the, a, any, a value is going to be calculated and placed in the right place. So the number of trials, you can use code to, to tell you the number of trials and then and write it in line with your, with your narrative. So in this case, this is what it would look like, uh, inline code would look like in, in your R Markdown document. Um, the average launch time is code minutes. And when you compile your report, it's gonna come out looking like this. So again, any magic number replaced by code will minimize opportunities for those types of errors. Um, so you might say, this is great, and it, is, and, it, and it sounds like something that I could use, but it's not that simple. I, can't just, I don't just sit down on my computer and um, you know, start to finish, do my analysis, and write my report. It's just not that easy. I do my analysis. I try a bunch of different things. It's spread across multiple scripts, multiple directories. Um, I have a complex problem, a, a complex analysis. So I, and, and John told me I shouldn't copy and paste code. So, um, so I can't possibly use our markdown, um, but it, it turns out that there is a way that you can that you can do this. Um, so, and that is that code that resides in other scripts can be referenced in your R markdown document. And this is how you, you go about doing that. Again, I'm sorry it's hard to see here, but uh, what you do is you use a tag that in in your script that denotes that that the the following uh, few section you know few lines of code are uh, need to be tracked by Knitter. So you see at knitter here, and then you give it a little, you give it a name, and then in your R Markdown document, you're going to reference that name, um, tidy rib data, and what that's going to do is it's going to go out to all the scripts that it needs to go to, pull the results of the code that it needs to pull, and put those into your document. <clears throat> so the next topic that I want to talk about is um, reports that are easy to run when things change, whether your data changes your assumptions change, when something changes, um, or you want to rerun your analysis in the future, uh, a similar analysis in the future, we want our reports, our reporting to be agile enough to accommodate that. So again, um, I'm showing you, uh, this, this, this will be hard to see here, so I apologize for that, but um, the important way that our markdown can help you here is that you have the ability to pass parameters for key inputs into your R markdown document that 
that, that can basically change the course of, of your analysis. And so the example I'm showing here is that we performed our analysis uh, on all the rib boat launch times during the day. And so I, I have a line here that says params day or night day. And so then in our analysis, we just filtered our, our rib data to daytime only and, and proceeded from there. Um, we might find out from our sponsor that, um, you know, actually, I think we want to redo this with all of the data or with just the nighttime launches. Um, so we can just come back in here, change this parameter to night, and, and recompile our code. So the way that, um, the way that I like to use this or, or that, that we find useful is to think ahead of time, be proactive in thinking about what, the, uh, what are the ways that you're, you might be asked to change your analysis, what are the ways that uh, different trajectories that your analysis could feasibly be taken, um, given questions that you might be asked, and um, upfront make those, uh, those key inputs um, changeable by a parameter that you can pass into your report. So, uh, outside of our, our community, this, this is used for things like, um, say you're writing a, uh, you have sales data for all different regions, for example, and you want to rerun the same report over and over again. The report's going to be the same. The only thing that needs to change is the region that you're talking about. So all you have to do is change the region and rerun your report. So, so that's the um, that's way that it is used outside of our community, but um, I, we use it slightly differently um, to the same uh, end. <clears throat> and then um, this is another uh, feature that, that our Markdown offers. If you're rerunning your, your code often, but you have some piece of code that takes a really long time to run, you don't want to rerun. Uh, maybe you have a simulation, and it, and it takes 15 minutes to, to uh, finish running. You don't want to be rerunning this frequently um, if you don't have to. And so our Markdown allows you to cache code chunks. So it's just uh, one little line here, cache equals true. What this does is it will, in the future, when you recompile this report, that code chunk is not going to be evaluated unless, you, unless it needs to be evaluated. So I'm not going to really get into the, the details of how it works, um, but this can be a powerful tool that can help you uh, regenerate reports quickly if, if they otherwise would have taken a long time to run. And then finally, um, matching your format's organization. This is sometimes a, um, we've, this can be a roadblock. People say, oh, well, I would love to do this, but I have to, ultimately, I'm going to have to copy and paste it into Word because I have to match my template. And, um, and so, so it can sound like a roadblock, but this is a, a more recent um, development with our markdown. But, but you can now um, include a reference document in your project directory that's going to allow you to match your, out, your uh, formats, excuse me, your organization's format. This also works for PowerPoint templates. Um, so the way that it's implemented here is, is just um, Word document, and then you, you put in a reference document, a reference docx, and, and, uh, and include a, an example file in your directory that it is going to look at, uh, check, see what the theme, you know, what the formatting rules are, and apply that to your document. So this is a really cool, uh, really cool thing that you can do now. Um, if you're really if you're really eager, you can edit CSS directly. Um, so the, to make these slides, we actually edited the CSS file that, um, to, to make this look a lot like our template. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Um, so there's other ways as well. So all that is to say, um, just don't let this, um, don't let the need to match your, your organization's template be, uh, be something that prevents you from, from using our markdown. Um, so the, the final part of our, of, of this section and uh, is, is talking about shareable code, making sure that your code can easily be shared with somebody else. And arguably, this is the most important section because if your work is to be reproduced by somebody else, you necessarily need to be able to share it with somebody else and have them run it. So I'm going to be talking about a few things that we can do to make sure that our code is easily run when we give it to somebody else. Uh, I'm going to talk about these three boxes individually, but they're going to kind of build up to, one, to a scenario, which is that you want to share your code with a colleague. Um, and let's just say, for the sake of argument, that you are planning to zip up your directory and email it to your colleague, have them open it, and run it. They're going to do a tech review on your work. And so they need, you're going to zip up your directory, email it to them, and they run it. Uh, 
I'll, I'll talk about a couple things to think about along the way that, to get you there. First thing you need to do, of course, is be confident that it works on your own computer with your own data. And that seems simple, but, um, but it's, a, it's an important place to start. One way that you can, that you can do this is by, um, is by restarting R liberally as you're throughout your development. And the reason for doing this is that it ensures that there's no, um, I, I say, lurking dependencies. There's nothing in your in, in environment or packages loaded that are going to cause some unwanted effect in your analysis that, that you weren't thinking about. Um, this is something that has happened to me where maybe I'm working on debugging a function and I create some temporary variable x. And um, so I'm going along and a couple hours later, I, I, go, I get interrupted or I, maybe it's the next day, a couple hours later I pick this back up and I, and I later on use x later in my code. And, um, and the only, only way that you would find this out is that maybe you get some wacky result. So maybe your code doesn't even result in an error. You get some wacky result. Um, so if I had thought to restart R, make sure that I'm starting from a fresh session, these are the kinds of problems that I can easily avoid. Um, so just being, being um, proactive and, and restarting R liberally as you're working can help with this. Um, starting a script with rm list equals ls, if, if this code doesn't um, doesn't jump out at you, I'll tell you what it does. Um, this is a common way that, that I used to start scripts, and, and maybe some of you do too. Um, what it does is it clears out all the, the, the uh, clears out your R environment, so all the variables in your environment. But importantly, what it does not do is restart your R session, so any packages that are loaded are still loaded. Um, so so if, there's any, if there's going to be any conflicts with respect to packages, this doesn't help you. Um, and then just it, it sometimes if you plan to share your analysis with somebody else, which you do, um, it can be bad form to start a script this way because uh, this, this assumes that your collaborator is, is working only on this one thing and when they open your code and run it, that they, weren't, they didn't have some, some other important code you know, that they were working on and things in their environment and that you just wiped when they run your code. So, um, so just not a good habit. It's not the end of the world, but, uh, but not a good habit. <coughs> Testing our functions to make sure that they do what we think they do is important, and we don't necessarily do this in a formalized way very often. It's more common that we do this in an ad hoc way. You write a, you write a function, you check it seems to work on to do what I, what I wanted it to do. Maybe I try a couple different uh, other inputs, and I, you know, do some, I do some checking, but uh, not anything formal. Um, I won't talk about the function, the package too much, but I do want to just draw your attention to as a resource. Uh, the, this package, test that, is a package that makes this really easy to do. Um, so let me just show you a very simple function um, where it's just going to add the val add two values together. The test that function um, it, it gives you an intuitive way to write write tests to say um, I expect that one plus one is going to equal two, zero plus zero is going to equal zero. Right, so the code here is not that important, um, but just thinking about ways that you can be more formal about testing of your functions to make sure that they're doing actually what you think that they're doing. Okay, so you, now you're fairly convinced that it works on your own computer with your own data. Um, we need to make sure that if we feed our analysis new data that it's still gonna work as well. Um, <coughs> One way that you can do this is by is what's called defensive programming, or sometimes called assertions-based programming. Why is this important? Sometimes new data can can uh, vary in ways that don't break your code. So let me give you an example. Um, if you your code might be written so that uh, it works on numeric values, and a missing value or an NA would result in an error or uh, or, or it just wouldn't run. Um, let's say you, you're in our rib example that next month there's another test and we wanna make sure that we can quickly ingest this, the new test data into our analysis and run our, our analysis again. Um, and the new data collector for a missing value uses 999 instead of NA, which is a common convention. Um, in this case, our code's still gonna run because we because 999 is numeric, and we're not gonna even know that there's a problem until 
we get to the to the end and find out that you know we're we're getting a, a strange result. So this is a so checking for things like that along the way um, throughout your analysis is going to ensure that um, that you don't run into those types of problems in the future. So assertions-based programming, and again, I'm not going to talk about uh, this package in any great detail, but I, I again draw your attention to a, a tool that we find useful, assert R, <clears throat> and it lets you do, the, do these kinds of things by verifying, adding steps into your functions that verify um, certain assumptions that you have about your data. So assert R is a good tool. Now this is the end of the road. Um, you want to make sure that you've when you now you've zipped up your directory and sent it to your collaborator that it's going to work when they open it and try to run it on their computer. What are the things that need to happen for your collaborator to run your code? Well, first, they need to know how to run your code. They need to know the steps. Um, I'm going to talk about each of these in detail. The working directory and the file paths need to work properly. And then all of the, the packages that are required to run your code need to be installed and loaded. OK, so we'll walk through each of these. Um, through the next couple of slides, I'm going to keep referring back to readme files. Um, a, a readme file is a very simple, easy win um, that can help you here. Um, it's, it can be a place where you can include any important information that somebody needs to know to run your code. So as an example, are there, do, your code, do your scripts need to be run in a certain order? Well, the easiest way to do that is to write in your readme file, steps to run my code, run this script, then run this script, then run this script. That's the easiest way to accomplish this. Right, so you would send your, your file to your collaborator, say, open my code, read the readme file, and do what it says. Okay, so that's, that's the simplest solution. Um, and I'm going to keep mentioning readme files, so, so you'll hear that a lot. Um, another way that you can handle this is with a, a run all script, which is what I like to do, actually. Um, this is an example of what, what that might look like. It's just a script that's going to do all the things that you need to do in the order that you want to do them. So, um, load all of the packages that you need to do that that you need. Uh, load any functions that you need. Run your scripts in the order that you want them run in, and then generate your report at the end. Knit your report. Um, so, in this case, you would say to your collaborator, "Open my files and run the run all script." And it's going to just take care of all of the important steps that you um, that need to happen along the way for your script your code to run properly. <clears throat> so we also need the working directory to be to be set right and and um, and, and in such a way that your analysis is portable. So uh, if if you're the whether or not your code runs on somebody else's computer should not depend on where they decide to save it. If they save it on their desktop, it should work. If they save it in a documents directory, it should work. And um, John mentioned our project our our project files, and actually that's a simple solution here is that um, our project files help you here because all, when somebody double clicks on an R project file, it automatically sets the working directory for them. Um, so you could say in your readme file, open my files, double click the R project file, and run the run all script. Right? So there's um, R project files help you here. Um, another tool that we have found valuable is, the, is called the here package. And the here package, what it does is it detects the root directory of your project, of your analysis folder. And, and it makes it easy to write uh, file paths that are independent, uh, platform independent. It's especially useful when you have, when you're working in a subdirectory and trying to reference uh, data or a script in another subdirectory. So let's just say you're in your, um, you, in your, you have your R markdown document and it lives in a reports folder, reports subdirectory. And it needs to load some data that's in your data folder. Uh, the here package makes it easy to write the path that's required to load data that's in another subdirectory. So, um, so again, uh, this is something that you could go back and look up, and um, and we find it very useful, and it does help in this in this respect. Um, a common way that people handle working directory is to just hard code it in. Uh, say set working direc directory to you know, whatever it is. And, um, and the problem here, of course, is just that it's, your code is no longer portable. Now, it, it matters where they put it, uh, where your collaborator saves it on their computer. And the problem is that your directory structure is likely to change between now and six months from now when you open this back up again. 
So you, your code's not even going to work on your own computer if you do it this way in the future, right? So, um, so it gets the job done, but it's not a, it's not a good way to do this um, that's kind of foolproof going forward. And then finally, all the packages that are required to run your code need to be installed and loaded. This is just a just an example um, function that you could use to you could include this in your run all script, for example, um, to make sure that the packages that your collaborator has the packages that they're that are required, and to and to do it in a way that um, your it's um, it's kind of a courteous way to install packages because it's only installing packages if they're needed. Right, so um, so this will be here for your reference later. But this is a, this is a function that we, that we've found success with. Again, if there's a specific version of a package, you can write that in your README file. Say my code requires this package, this package, and this package specifically this version. So you can just write that in your in your README file. Um, if you use session info, you can see all of the packages that are currently loaded in your session. Um, so you could just copy them all down into your README file. Um, or alternatively, you could add some checks into your run all script and say, you know, if there's, if I, package might be loaded, but is it the right version? If not, exit with this, you know, this message. Um, so a couple options here. So um, onto the last section, um, we've now taken reproducible We've, we've gone from the very beginning of getting started on an analysis. We've walked you through steps that you can take during your analysis. And I just showed you a couple things that you can do after you finish your analysis. You need to go you know, to the final step of presenting your results. Um, I'm going to look back at, at our outline that we started at the, at the beginning and, and remind you that the topics that we talked about, although we mentioned we, we talked um, about R mostly, um, these are not necessarily R specific. And um, so let me walk through them a little bit. So John talked about being organized in your analysis, um, having your analyses self-contained in a single directory, um, formatting data. So um, no matter what kind of tool you're using, managing your data, keep doing things like keeping your data read only to the extent possible, um, uh, keeping your data in a certain format, this tidy format that we talked about, um, that is not specific to R, but it's a, just a good high level best practice. Uh, when you're performing your analysis, doing things like adding comments, adding readme files, um, doing things that document the steps that you took during your analysis, what you did and why you did it, so that somebody else can understand the choices that you made, or you can remember the choices that you made. Um, doing things that minimize your opportunities to introduce errors into your analysis, avoiding copying and pasting as much as, you, as, much as possible, um, doing things like um, when, if there's a way to uh, remove some point and click and turn it into a script, you can um, try to do that as well. And, I, and, I, and again, I talked about reporting and shareable code. The way I talked about them were, um, was kind of R specific, but they don't necessarily have to be. Thinking of ways that you can try to close the gap between your reporting and your code, trying to link them in some way, whether even if you can't link them directly like you can with R Markdown, uh, narrowing that gap and, 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 and updating your reports in ways that minimize opportunities for errors as much as possible. Um, are all good practices and are not necessarily specific to R. So these basic principles can be implemented with other tools. We, ha we have information about these, um, these other tools. So if you're interested in these, you can come ask us, talk to us after. Um, but I'll just show you a couple of them, ways that you can implement them in Excel, for example. Uh, this is an example of, of a calculator that somebody in our division, um, John Bell, which I guess wa was on here, and maybe it's cut off, uh, made, made this Excel calculator. And you notice there's all kinds of comments in here, right? So, so that you know exactly what each cell means, what it does, um, what the calculation is, why you, why, you, um, why you made the calculation the way you did. Um, if you're using an Excel calculator like this, um, and you're, you're going to use it for an analysis today, and then you want to use it in a month for another analysis, make a copy of that spreadsheet and put it into a, a new directory, self-contained, instead of 
uh, opening up your Excel calculator, hand jamming in some numbers, and writing down the result. And then in next month, opening the same calculator, opening, you know, putting in some numbers and writing down the result. So you can, uh, ag again, minimize the opportunity to introduce error and keep a history of what you did. You could include a readme file in that self-contained directory. So there's, there's ways that you can implement this, um, some of these concepts in Excel. If you're reshaping data, there's a, I guess it's an add-in called Power Query. It's an add-in um, that allows you to uh, go from a wide format data to a tidy format data, and, and uh, Power Query will keep track of the steps that you took along the way to get there. So again, documenting what you did and why you did it is important. In jump, if you jump, we, we do a lot of point and click, but there's, uh, there's an opportunity to, to save, your, uh, save, let's see, uh, save a script. Um, so you can, you can do that again, again to document the steps that were taken, even though this is largely a point and click um, uh, method. Um, so, but we can, we can keep track of what we did and why. Uh, Kevin mentioned that our slides, and John, John as, as well, that our slides are, were built in our markdown, so, uh, so the, the source code for these slides uh, will be available after the talk. So what you can do is you can try to run this code for yourself. You can inspect the source code. You can see how we did what we did. Um, we'll also make available a directory that has, um, has more files in it. It has an example analysis of the, this made-up rib data. Um, so it's a very simple analysis, but, uh, but with some cleaning, a couple cleaning scripts, a couple uh, analysis scripts, an R markdown report, um, a run all script, a read, I don't know if this has a run all script, but a readme file. So you, you can see some of, the, um, some of the things that we talked about today in action in this uh, directory. So this will be available as well for you to, you, you to look at. Um, and that's all we have today, so I appreciate your um, attention, and we're at the end of, of DataWorks, so, uh, I, so thank you for sticking with us to the end here today. Um, so if you have any questions, we're happy to take them. Yes? Can you put this back in front of the Yeah, um, so I don't know exactly yet how we will, I know that the, as, ac across DataWorks, the, the slides for the um, for the mini tutorials are will be on the website. Oh, okay. You're, you're talking about creating these packages as part of the project, and you take the whole thing. <laughs> Sorry, and um, you take the whole thing. Sorry. And, uh, put it on something like SharePoint. Yeah, I think I don't see why you couldn't. And um, so, and actually, I I don't know a lot about SharePoint, but my understanding is you do get a little bit of version control with with SharePoint as well. So, um, so. Sure, I think that that's, a, that's kind of a good intermediate step, actually, between um, uh, going all the way up to using Git and GitHub, for example. So um, if that's more user-friendly, then absolutely, you can uh, manage your files on a SharePoint site. Um, but again, keeping your, your analyses self-contained. So, so I would recommend, if you're going to use SharePoint, that you know, everything is all under one project directory and then that directory is what gets posted onto, onto SharePoint. Um, so sure, yep. Yes? So I like to use LaTeX a lot for yep. documents. Um, how well does R read LaTeX notation in a R markdown document? So that's actually, um, and maybe you guys can correct me if I'm, well, I'm not gonna go all the way back, but. LaTeX uh, syntax to write math equations in R. <coughs> So, is that good enough for you? Or do you use some of the advanced LaTeX? If you well, really do a lot of custom all, format. All of it, all of it. So, okay. you know, section headers, bibliography stuff, yeah. you know, certain yeah, equations. So yeah. I mean. You're using the whole suite of LaTeX features. Uh, that's, uh, that document, that tech file, is still just plain text. So you can preserve the history of that. You can follow a lot of these tips. But as far as the sort of R markdown niceties, the uh, linking between documents and code, I, I don't know if that's how available that is. I know that there, to, to some extent, you, I know that you can, because you can also include um, uh, HTML code, for example, right into your R markdown document. So if you, if you look at these slides, you'll notice that 
um, that it's it's hard to uh, to position uh, to position your content on these these HTML slides. So if you have one, if we had a slide with one uh, one line on it, it's all the way at the top. So if you go back and look at the source code for this these slides, you'll notice that we put in some HTML like um, breaks, for example, to kind of move things down on the slides and uh, you know so 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 it does allow you to um, to so I'm not I'm not sure the details, but I know that to some extent you can include some um, tags from H, some HTML tags. You can include some um, probably t uh, tech set, you know type formatting, and it will be compiled by Pandoc and, and into your final pro product. Yeah. So just a second. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to jump in on that. So previous to Pandoc and previous to our markdown, it was sweet. And if I remember right, so it sounds like Sweet might be a better tool for you in the sense that you write a LaTeX document, and then that allows you to actually insert our code and our output into your LaTeX document. So that was the precursor, and uh, so that might help you more. I think if you look on, if you look up the, our Markdown resources that we have the slide for, um, you will find information about Sweet um, that you you could. You'll come across that if you look at those resources. So, or you can come talk to us. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time.